Let's stand on our feet. Anybody know that prayer works today? Yeah. Amen. For me. Is there anybody in the house that stands in need of prayer this morning? Just say pray. Say it like you mean it this morning. Hallelujah. When you bow down. When you bow down at the altar. Hallelujah. At the altar. Somebody say please. as we come to the Lord this morning in prayer and thanksgiving because he is a great God we thank you Heavenly Father that you are the Lord of our light and our salvation we thank you that you are indeed the stronghold of our lives God when fear comes in we know 
because you are our light and our salvation and our stronghold, Lord, that fear will be chased away. We thank you, Father, that where there has before been defeat, we know that Jesus has conquered for us. And that's why we come with assurance in our hearts and say with the psalmist, the Lord is my light and my salvation. And the Lord is a stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? Well, Father, we thank you that we can walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And you say to us, that's the spirit not of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. We thank you that we can come this morning and we ask, Lord, that please teach us to seek your face. Teach us to dwell in your presence. Please, Lord, teach us to gaze upon the beauty of your face. That in the midst of all these ugly things, some of them come from within us. Lord, we will see the beautiful face of the Lord Jesus. And that as we gaze on your face, Lord, we shall know that we are safe. Because you keep us safe in your dwelling. You keep us safe in your temple. And you will hide us in your tabernacle. And Lord, and you will put us upon a rock that is higher than ourselves. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that our heads then will be exalted and we can come together and shout of jo with shouts of joy and sing to you, O Heavenly Father, and make music to you, O God, with thankful thankfulness in our hearts. We thank you that in the midst of fear, in the place of rebellion, in the place of misery, you put a song in our hearts. And today we can come and sing to the Lord a joyful song. We can come today and praise your name. We can come today and join with angels in heaven and sing holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Oh, Father, the whole earth is filled with your power. We thank you, Heavenly Father. Oh, God, you have reminded me again one time that even if your mother can forsake you, but the Lord will never forsake you, and the Lord will receive you. We thank you that you are closer to us than a brother. You are closer to us even than our own breath. We thank you, Father, that when you are there, everything is all right. Because the Lord is our light and our salvation. What shall we be afraid of? Thank you, Father. Teach us to say we will have confidence. Help us to have confidence and assurance that we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. But teach us to wait on you, Heavenly Father, to wait for the Lord. Because you said to us, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Oh God, they shall run and not be weary and walk and not faint. Teach us to wait on you, Heavenly Father. Help our hearts to be strong and stay in you. That in the midst of turmoil, we will know that someone can speak to our hearts and say, peace be still. And we can say, Lord, in the midst of hell, it is well with my soul. Oh God, teach us to see you in the midst of hell and so we know that greater is he that is in us than he that is out there in the world we thank you Lord jesus that you are the same yesterday today and forever we can walk with you you promise to walk with us and we just want to say thank you because victory is ours oh lord there's going to be the last times when you shall appear in the clouds and every eye shall see you and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And all the saints will be marching in full of glory. Oh Father, for the devil never to come to, cl close to us anymore, there will be victory in Jesus. And we thank you for that eternal plan that Lord, we can have that hope in you 
And that's the eternal hope. And we stay in that hope with love and faith and, and glory, Lord. We have overcome the world. We thank you. We even thank you for our problems. We thank you for our troubles. As someone says, we thank you for the valleys. We thank you for the mountains. Oh God, if that did not happen, we would know that your word is true. But we know that there's victory. There is victory. Because you have overcome the world. We bless you, Lord Jesus. We thank you. Help us to lift you up. We lift you up in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
How many remember the day that you were sinking so deep in sin? As the songwriter said, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within. How many remember the day when you knew that you were wretched and that you were undone and were in need of a savior? Someone to rescue me. Someone to save me. Someone to turn my life around. And how many know that someone was Jesus? He picked me up uh, and he turned me around. And he placed my feet on God's solid ground. I remember the day when I thought I had it together. Because I could sing a little bit. Because I could play a little bit. I thought I had it together. But God showed me just how wretched I really was. How destitute I really was how hopelessly and aimlessly lost I really was. And after showing me me, and showing me his love for me, how many understand that it was not by your own holiness or your own righteousness that you are saved, but we're saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Oh, thank God for the grace. When I was sinking, I didn't know I was sinking. Have you ever been in a situation that you know you, you were sinking? That you realize that had it not been for the Lord who was on your side. But now, I'm saved. I was seeking. But while I was sinking, I was seeking. Peter had the intelligence to realize that even though he was sinking on the water, he reached up and cried, Lord, save me. And when he reached, see, it's not enough to speak it, but you gotta demonstrate your need for his help by reaching up to him. And as Peter reached up, Jesus reached down. How many remember the day when you reached up, the Lord reached down? And when he reached down, he began to pull you up out of the muck, out of the mire, and out of the clay that you were in. It was the grace. T'was grace that brought me safe thus far. And it is that same grace that will lead me on. Put your hands together if you believe it this morning. I turn about clap your hands like you're thankful. Clap your hands if you're grateful. Clap your hands if you know it was nobody but the Lord. Nobody but Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, it was nobody but the Lord. First of all, let me just express my gratitude for being back home. It's no place like home. I said that on Wednesday night, but I am so grateful and thankful. And I appreciate those who have been standing and preaching the gospel and our traveling. And I'm really grateful for your prayers. It's just good to be back home. And I said on last week when I was in... Um, 
Durham, North Carolina. I said, there's no place like home. Amen. So I want you all to know that I miss you all and I love you. And it's just good to be back one more time. Let us pray. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Christ, for the spirit of worship. For you are worth our worship. And we have come for the purpose of worshiping you in spirit and in truth as a collective body of believers. God, we have literally done our best to give you what we deem as your due praise. And we realize, God, no matter what we do, we can't offer unto you the kind of praise that you're worthy of. For you're so high and so glorious and so majestic, so mighty in all of your ways. Yet, God, we pray that you receive our best. And now, God, as you have listened to us, help us, God, now to listen to you. Somebody in this house is broken. Let them leave here knowing, God, that you have mending power. Somebody is dis disturbed today. May they leave here knowing that you have the peace that surpasses all understanding. Somebody is going through a trial or a testing time. But let them leave here today knowing that they can make it if they just look to the hills from whence cometh their help. We give you praise. And we thank you, God, above all things and all people for your beloved Son, our Savior, our Lord, and our Redeemer. And we thank you, God, for the precious, potent power of your Holy Spirit, in which without him, God, our gathering would be in vain. And so, God, we pray by that same Spirit that your word will go forth and not return unto you void, but accomplish the purpose for which you have sent it. And God, we'll be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. We ask it, God, in Jesus' name, our Lord and our Christ, forgive us of our sins and receive our prayer. And the church says, amen, amen, amen. Once again, I just want to thank God. I want to thank God for one of our sons in the ministry, Brother Pedro Brian, who is, uh, where is he? Okay, there, Pedro Brian Graham, and, uh, who is uh, with us. I said Pedro Graham Brown, I'm sorry. Who is, uh, I may fail to mention this morning that he also has uh, gotten his doctorate and uh, been working tenaciously in the New York now, him and his lovely wife, Frankie. And uh, he shared the word with us this morning, the time is now. And uh, I was messing with him on yesterday because when I talked to him for just a little while, he told me that uh, his wife is pregnant again and ready to give birth, amen. And over the last, over the last two or three years, he's told me he's been studying the books. But I believe he's had some other explorations <laughs> that didn't come through Southern our liberty. Amen. That's all right. We celebrate with you all. Amen. <laughs> I'll tell you, you never know what I might say. <laughs> in the letter in the epistle to Timothy, the second letter written by the Apostle Paul, there's a brief word for us. I want to examine verses 3 through 7. Second Timothy 1, 3 through 7, I'm sorry. Taking your Bible in your hand. This book is the Word of God. It was written with me in mind. It has the power to change my life. I have the power to receive it. I reject it. What I do with it determines what it can do in me. It is God's gift to me for the abundant life. Amen. Amen. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did as without ceasing. I remember you in my prayers night and day. Greatly desiring to see you being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, I am persuaded it is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. 
For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound or disciplined mind. For God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power and of love and of a sound or disciplined mind. I want to talk to you today, and I want you to talk to yourself by saying, I can get through this. Amen. I can do this. I can do this. Amen. I can do this. I can get through this, and I can do this. One of the most trying and tempting and testing times of any believer is to get through the tumultuous trials and troubles of everyday life. Because many of us have been led to believe that once we get saved, once we're sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption, that all of our problems would cease. But there are two or three witnesses in the house today that could testify and to say that it appears that as once I gave my life to Christ, my problems did not cease, but it appears as if they increase. Does anybody in the house know what I'm talking about? Because there's something about committing ourselves unto God that sets us up and positions us to be attacked by the enemy. In fact, somebody said, and I agree with them and concur 100%, that if the devil is not attacking you, then evidently you're no threat to the devil. But the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 3 and 12 that every person who attempts to live for God will come under persecution. That is to say that once you make up in your mind to serve God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your might, the enemy will come against you. And too often in life, what happens to us when we find ourselves under attack, rather than to look unto God who is able to deliver us, many of us give up and give in. As the preacher talked to us at 8 o'clock this morning, we find ourselves confessing Christ as a living hope, but living a defeated life down here. On our way to heaven, as a result of him who we believe has the power to transition us from earth to heaven, but don't believe he has the power to take care of us while we're on earth. But I stop by to tell somebody this morning that regardless of what you're going through, you ought to come to the summation that you can make it and you can get through this. I don't know what your trial is. I don't know what your trouble is. I don't know where God is allowing you to be tested. But whatever it is, my Bible tells me in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that no temptation has taken you but that which is common to man. Somebody say everybody goes through it. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you're able, but will with the temptation make a way for you to escape. Why? So you might be able to bear. In other words, whatever you're going through, God has enabled you to get through it. The Bible says God's eyes on the sparrow. If God will take care of the sparrow, he'll also take care of his people. Am I right about it? God is able. And anybody who's been born again, anybody who's been serious about their walk and their life with Christ, although you may have a testimony of what you have gone through, you got to have a testimony of what God has brought you through. Am I right about it? If, if you're born again, you haven't been through anything that God has not kept you in and brought you through. So when Paul writes this letter to Timothy, many believe he writes this as his last letter, informing Timothy that he is on the verge of leaving this world. However, Paul writes Timothy because he understands that God has raised Timothy up to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Timothy was afraid. 
And sometimes in order to do God's will, or some of us fail to do God's will, because many of us are afraid. We're afraid of what might happen if we trust God. We're afraid of what might happen if we walk by faith and not by sight. What will happen to me? What will happen to my family? What will people say to me? And Paul writes unto Timothy and he says, my son in the ministry, he says in verse 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear. What are you afraid of? What are you scared of? Why are you afraid to be a bold witness for God when you were not afraid to be a bold witness for the devil? When we were in the world, we did everything unashamedly. Didn't care what nobody thought. In fact, we boasted about it. We lived our lives for the devil, and we gave him glory out of everything we said and everything we do. And then we get converted, and all of a sudden, we get dignified, and we get too sophisticated to give God some glory, to give God some praise. And I ain't just talking about what takes place in the sanctuary. I'm talking about what takes place when you wake up in the morning. The ability just to say, God, thank you. Scared of what folk will say about you. If you live the changed life that you're supposed to be living. Afraid of what might happen to you. If you stand up for the gospel as Christ stood up for you. Afraid of losing a job that God got for you. Afraid of what somebody might do when you fail to understand that God is greater than anybody that might come against you. Paul writes Timothy, he tells him, look, you can do this. Don't be afraid. But he gives Timothy several reasons why he's able to do it. First of all, I want you to notice, if you will, that he says in verse 5, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmama and then in your mama. And if this was Father's Day, I would ask the question, where was the daddy? <laughs> but Paul says to Timothy, I want to call to your remembrance that you have something in you. Not something you originated, but something that trickled down from those who knew God before you knew God. And whenever a person has been born again, I maintain you may not be able to leave your kids a lot of money and a lot of wealth, but you will leave them with a sound, true doctrine of who God is. He says, I want you to remember that there's something on the inside of you, Timothy, that started with your grandmother. And your grandmother passed it down to your mother. And your mother has passed it down to you. You want to know why we've got so many senseless killers today? Because there are not enough grandmamas and grandmothers and fathers who are passing the gospel down. I attributed much of what's going on today as a result of those who grew up in my generation. Deacon Weaver and those who of his age grew up in the builder generation. Those who came out of World War, World War II. But we're called those who are not a part of the builders, but the bloomers. That is to say, I grew up in that generation when jobs and opportunities began to be a flourishing for, for people of color and for those that were poor. And as a result, we quit passing the uh, gospel and we start passing dollars. We were more concerned about how well we live than how well our children were reared up. So we, did, we stopped giving them the word. We stopped giving them the gospel. We stopped giving them Christ and we started giving them money. We gave them tennis shoes. We gave them pants. We gave them clothes that they couldn't once afford. But we failed to give them Christ. Nothing wrong with the shoes. Nothing wrong with the pants. But that won't suffice them in the real world. And what has happened to our children and our youth today is that they have no foundation to return to. My brother and I sometimes talk about where we were at one time in our lives. 
And we talk about the fact that the only reason I believe we're saved today is because somebody before us was saved. And somebody was praying for us when we were not praying or too stupid to pray for ourselves. And what was in our grandparents and what was in our parents and those that were around us, our family members, trickled down to us. So although we were in the streets and in the world and running wild and reckless, we were spared because we had a foundation to come back to. Our kids are dying today because they have no foundation. They have church houses on every corner. And in, in, in every state in every city in this country there are four or more local congregations on every corner and the world is getting worse because we're giving them a lot of stuff and we fail to give them the savior we're afraid to give them the savior because we want them to be cool but i better tell you it's better to not be cool here want to keep up with the Joneses. And what the world needs today is more Jesus. And Paul says to Timothy, look, I'm not going to be here longer, much longer. And you've got to carry this gospel forward. And you can't be scared of what might happen to you. The Roman persecution that was expanding during that time. Don't be afraid of dying for Christ. See, the reason the missionary field is suffering today is because there are so many Sunday morning Christians who are afraid to go on the mission field because they're more in love with the world than they are in the Word. But when you know you've been called, when you know you've been chosen, when you know God has called you out of darkness into your marvelous light, it's not about what you have or what you might lose. It's all about what God wants and what God demands. Let me hurry to a close. You can get through this, first of all, because there were some examples before you. Notice what he says. He says, your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, have passed this faith down to you. Paul also talked about this in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, when he says, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Go back and read chapter 11. He talks about those Old Testament saints who endured the hardships and the trials and the tribulations of everyday life for the kingdom of God's sake. And he says, looking back on them, he says, we're surrounded with a great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us. And so what he's saying in essence, if your mama can make it, if your grandmama can make it, if your daddy can make it, if your granddaddy can make it, you can get through this. Why? Because no temptation, no trial, no trouble has come upon you but the same kind of trial that's come upon everybody else. But the good news of that text in 1 Corinthians 10 and 13 is that God won't give you individually. God won't give us a collective body of believers more than we can handle or deal with. And how many know when we're going through something, while we're going through it, we always feel like we can't make it. We feel like giving up. We feel like throwing in time. And that's why the Bible tells us, don't go by your feelings. Don't go by your flesh. Walk by your faith. Too many of us operate on our feelings. What we feel like. What we don't like. What we don't want to go through. What we don't want to put up with. Have you ever thought about what somebody did for you to get where you are? You ever thought about what somebody put up with for you to be where you are? Sometimes when I see these young children, and especially when it's the parents or grandparents, and they say, boy, that girl or that boy just wild. It's bad. And I always say, where do you think they got it from? <laughs> Amen. They wasn't just born with it on purpose. It trickled down from somebody. And so... He says you got some examples. And one of the things that ought to be a motivator for any believer is that you ought to be able to remind yourself that you can make it because you've seen other people do it. But see, the problem with some of us, we think too little of ourselves. 
We believe everybody else is superheroes, but we believe ourselves to be insufficient and inadequate. But I'll stop by to tell you, every biblical character from Genesis to Revelation was just like us. There are no superheroes in the Bible except Jesus Christ. Everybody was just as human as you are and as I am. But they made it because they understood that somebody had gone before them. And I stopped by to say that every Joshua can make it because of a Moses. Every Elijah can make it because of an Elijah. Every Peter is able to make it because of Christ. All of us ought to look at ourselves and say there were some examples before us. And if they can do it, I can do it. If they got through it, I can get through it. Tell yourself, I'm going to get through this. It might be rough. It might get tough. But I'm going to get through this. I'm not throwing in the towel. I was talking to someone just on the other day and and they were expressing their grief about their relationship. And they said, I don't put up with all that stuff. And I had to remind them that whoever you get hooked up with, you got to put up with something. I'm, I'm not just making this up. I told them, ain't no perfect people down here. I don't care what they built like. I don't care what the complexion of their skin is. I don't care what they got in the bank. If you hook up with anybody, after a while, by and by. Come on. Y'all know, y'all know I'm telling the truth. Here, here, here's the truth of that. Look across this nation alone. Look at television. People of every shape, size, color, and social status have gone through multiple relationships. Which says, it doesn't matter what you have or who you look like or what you possess, if you with anybody, you gotta put up with something. That's why, that's why they call them growing pains. <laughs> See, your pains will propel you to the place that God has destined you. They used to say in the gyms that I used to work out in. No pain? How many of y'all still work out? Don't raise your hand because you're going to embarrass the rest of us. About four folk and all these people raise their hand. No pain, no gain. And so, so you can't be afraid of what you might go through because whatever you go through, somebody else has already gone through it. Somebody else is going through it. And it used to be said like this from some of the older preachers, if you're not coming out of a storm, you're in a storm. And if you're not in a storm, you're headed into a storm. Why? Because that's the fate of every one of us. And so many believers give up on Christ and give up on the church because stuff happens. But I stopped by to tell you, you got to have that kind of tenacity, that determination that no matter what happens, a charge I have to keep and a God to glorify, I can't give up. And so he says, look at the examples before you. He says, your mother and your grandmother, they had that faith. And he says, I'm persuaded it's in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you, through the laying on of my hands. Now watch what Paul says. Paul says, not only are you to look back at your examples and others who have made it and motivate yourself because others have gone through it, but he says that you've got to eradicate the fears because you've got some potential on the inside of you. See, most of us think that when we get saved, we don't change. But I'll stop by to tell somebody, when you get saved, you get born again. That means you're a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become brand new. You're a new creature in Christ. 
So Paul says, look, you can make it, Timothy. You can do these things because there is some potential that lies within you. See, a lot of us, when we're going through our storms, you know we, what we do? And it's not wrong. We pray and ask God to get us through it. But sometimes you got to ask God to give you the wisdom to endure it. Because the Bible tells us in Romans 8, 28, that all things work together. Which means if God has allowed you to be in a situation that you don't desire to be in, but he left you in it, there's some good to come out of it. That's why I think when Paul prayed in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians when he had the thorn in his flesh, the Bible said he prayed three times, God, take this away from me. And three times, God ignored that prayer and then responded by saying, my grace, my favor will get you through this. Quit asking me to remove your trials. Quit asking me to stop all of your pains. Quit asking me to quit letting the devil be loosed in your life. He's also my minister. I'm using him to get you where I need you to go. He's got his day of demise. But why he may think he's doing it on his own, he's literally my instrument to get you where I want you to be. So you got to eradicate your fears. Why? Because you've got some potential on the inside. See, the Bible says in Philippians 4.13, I can do. Not some things. Not most things. Not the things that I think I'm skilled at. He says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus, who what? Strengthens. Which means there are times in life when the trials and the tests weaken me. But I can do this. I can get through this. Why? Because when I'm weak, then he makes me strong. My strength is not in my intelligence. It's not in my education. It's not in my bank account. My strength is in the Lord. I think uh, Pastor Moses prayed it in his prayer earlier. When he said in Psalm 27 and 1, God is our light. And our salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When my enemies and the wicked, my foes rise up against me, they stumble and fail. Though an host shall rise up against me, and this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after. And in that day of trouble, he will hide me. Anybody know he'll hide you? When the fiery doors are coming against you, when the enemy's trying to take you out, he'll hide you in his pavilion so that the enemy can't do you no harm. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that God has made me aware of the fact that some potential on the inside of me. 2 Peter 1 and 3 says, according to his divine power, God has past tense. Giving me everything I need for life and godliness. You think you can't make it because you think you're inadequate. And God says you can make it because everything you need, you got it. You're looking out here for deliverance. And God said, I put it on the inside of you. You think you need more money. You think you need a new man, a new woman. You think you need a new job. Now you just need to tap into what's on the inside of you. Because when others don't create a place for you, God has given you the ability to create your own. Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And let them have dominion over everything. The fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cow and all that creeps up on earth. Those in the sea, he says, you've got dominion. But if you think you're weak, you'll live like you're weak. If you think you have no power, you will live as those who have no power. And that's why, as the preacher said at 8 o'clock, so many of us are defeated. It's not because that is our life. God says it through Christ in John 10 and 10 that the thief comes not but for to kill, steal, and destroy. But I've come. 
that you might have life. Zoe, Z-O-E. Life. All that God is. Life. Everything that Christ possesses. Life. They come so you be miserable. I didn't come for you to be sad. I didn't come for you to be depressed. I didn't come for you to stay sick. I came to give you life. But you know what I've learned in life? Sometimes people can hand it out to you. But some of us are afraid to take it. Because with life comes responsibility. And most of us try to avoid anything that may possibly bring some trials into our lives but you ain't experienced life and you will never experience life until you lift out and stretch out your hand and take what God has in store for you you got to eliminate the fears and eradicate them because fear is not of God see the Bible tells us and Paul says this in verse 7 he says for God has not given us a spirit of fear. Now all of us have those emotional fears at times when, when sometimes your fears or your emotions can warn you. But notice Paul didn't say you don't ever get afraid of anything. Sometimes things are to fear us to keep us from making a mistake or destroying ourselves. But he says God didn't give you a spirit. In other words, you ought to not live daily in fear. Scared to start a new business. Scared to work on your marriage. Scared to go to school. Scared to try something new. Scared to go to Africa. Scared to go to India. Always afraid. Living by the what ifs. What if something goes wrong? What if it doesn't work? What if they say to me this, that, and the other? What if they call me everything? But what if it does work? Because there's a flip side to the what ifs in life. And oftentimes we dwell on the what if not. But what if it does happen? What if you do go to Africa and th thousands and millions of souls get saved? What if you do go to India and folk learn how to live and quit worshiping cattle and start worshiping Christ? What if you go behind prison walls and share the gospel of Jesus Christ and those notorious criminals are changed by the blood of Christ? What if? See, most of us say, what would happen to me? The late Dr. Martin Luther King said to the preachers of Montgomery that it's not what's going to happen to you that you ought to be concerned about. But what's going to happen to the sanitation workers if you don't stand up? What's going to happen to this nation if Christians don't stand up? What's going to happen to this country and our communities if we don't start standing and quit doing this flight into suburbia America trying to run from problems? Nothing wrong with living in suburbia America. But don't forget where you come from. Because I don't care who you are. When you got, go back far enough, all of us started in the South. I ain't giving me the amen, but it's the truth anyhow. All of us, our foreparents, used to have that, that labor of those on the other side of the tracks. Right here in Durham, I just came back from Durham, North Carolina, and as the preacher was taking me to the church, he was saying that the city is literally building a bridge so that the well-to-do people of Durham won't no longer have to go through the impoverished neighborhoods to get to a certain mall. So they're building a bridge over that community. And you hear people on news all the time. I never thought this would happen in our neighborhood. Can I, can I help somebody? Sin is in every neighborhood. And the only reason some, the media is not as heavy in some of those neighborhoods is because some of those are connected to the judges and others who keep it quiet. Eliminate the fears. Eradicate them. Why? Because God has given you potential. But notice, secondly, he says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but God has given us power. That is to say, inherent ability to discover our purpose. 
That is to say, according to 1 Corinthians 12, chapter, the Bible says that every one of us who are in the body of Christ has a specific purpose that God has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light to fulfill. Some time ago, a couple of years ago or so, we were talking about fulfilling our purpose and the assignment that we have. And I shared on that series of sermons that every day you wake up, you have an assignment. Every week you get through, you have an assignment. Every month you get through, you have an assignment. Every year you come to the end of, you ought to be able to say, I finished well. Because every day God awakens us, we awaken with purpose on purpose. Which means God woke you up not just to get through the day. There's something God has in store for you. And so he says, Timothy, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Power, which means your purpose. In Jeremiah, the first chapter, verse 1, it says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, and the word of the Lord said unto me, before I formed you. Before mom and daddy came together. Watch this. He says, I knew you. They didn't know you. They hadn't even thought of you. But before I formed you, in the belly of your mama's womb, I knew you intimately. And not only did I know you, but I ordained you. That's your purpose. I didn't just cause you to be born so you could be another Hebrew. I have a purpose for your life. And I've ordained you to be a prophet unto the nations. In other words, this is your specific assignment. And it didn't start when you got through school. It didn't start when you got to a certain age. It started before mom and daddy ever came before you. And before they ever got together as one. I ordained you. And every believer needs to understand his or her purpose. God forbid that we will go to our graves and never fulfill the purpose for which God has called us. In fact, let me just say it like this. When, when, when the believer, when the child of God understands the importance of fulfilling his or her purpose, there will be no such language as pew members. Because it says every part of your body, every part of the body of Christ will be engaged and actively engaged in doing what they were assigned to do. You've heard me share before that our physical bodies, 206 bones, means of cells and veins, and, and every body part has a specific assignment. Your eye was not designed to hear. Why? Because it was designed to see. Specific assignment. Your ear was not designed to see, it was designed to hear. Specific assignment. Paul, through the Holy Spirit, uses the analogy of the Holy Spirit and the body of Christ. And he says, just like God formed the body, that's how God has formed the body of Christ. Everybody that gets saved has a specific assignment. And when you don't discover what your assignment is, and you fail to fulfill your assignment, the whole body suffers. I forgot what sermon it was, but I shared a sermon once as I talked about this. And I said that statistically as it says that only 15 to 20 percent of Christians support the church. And I asked the question, what would you think of yourself or what, what would you think of God? If he woke you up in the morning and says, I'm going to allow 15 percent of your body to function and the 85 percent I'm going to shut down. 15% of your body will only function in the morning. And I asked the question, what body part would you want to function? Some people say eyes. Some people say brain. Some people say legs. But the truth is, if you don't have all the body parts, none of that works. And the church has never awakened to the fact that when we sit in the pews or just show up when we want to or do life and do Christ like we want to, the whole body suffers. Because if only 15% of our physical bodies were functional, all of us would be bedridden. And not only bedridden, but on life support. And that's why the church is struggling in America. That's why the church is struggling in the world. It's on life support. 
It's not even breathing on its own anymore. It's just living off of the respirators and the air of shouting and God's getting ready to do and God's getting ready to do and God's getting ready to do and I said when I get to heaven I'm going to ask God what took you so long? I done heard a hundred preachers say God get ready to do but the Bible says when Christ went to the cross he ain't getting ready to do he said it's finished. We're looking for him to do something else and he says I've done everything I'm going to do. It's now your time because you have a purpose. And I've raised you up for that purpose. So you got to learn how to exercise your faith. You got to believe that God will do exactly what he said he would do. Quit looking at your weakness and start looking at his strength. Quit telling yourself that you're not able and go to Ephesians 3 and 20 and say God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I ask, think, or imagine. Watch, through the power that works in me. So Paul says, as I go to a close, Paul says he has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a disciplined mind. That is to say, on this journey, we have to train our minds to deal with everyday challenges. We got to train our minds, discipline our minds, so that in the midst of the fiery furnace, we won't denounce Christ, but we will stand for Christ. A disciplined mind says, I don't know what I have to go through, but if God be for me, he's more than the world against me. A disciplined man says, yea, though I walk through the valley, I can't stop myself from going through it. But if I gotta go through it, yea, though I walk through the valley and the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because his rod and his staff they comfort me a disciplined man will remind you that God will never leave you nor forsake you a disciplined man Genesis 18 and 14 is there anything too hard for the Lord I wonder if there's two or three witnesses in the house it was too hard for mama. It was too hard for daddy. It was too hard for the lawyer. It was too hard for the doctor. But is there anything too hard for the Lord? A disciplined man reminds us that nay in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. Is there anybody in the house that knows your love this morning. God so loved the world that he gave his only, he didn't have none to choose from, his only son, that whosoever believeth shall not perish, but have everlasting life. A disciplined man says no weapon formed against me shall prosper come on talk to me and every tongue that rises up against me shall be condemned in judgment a disciplined man says fret not thyself because of evildoers for they shall soon pass away a disciplined man says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way and though he fall he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholds him in his hands. A disciplined man said I have been young but now I'm old but I've never never seen the righteous 
forsaken, a disciplined man, says some glad morning, Jesus Christ will come back again for a church without spot or wrinkle. A disciplined man says, Father, if it be your will, remove this cup. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. A disciplined man says, count it all joy, not if, but when you fall in the divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have a perfect work, that you might be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. A disciplined man says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men generously, but a disciplined man said, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he who wavers is like the sea tossed to and from. Let not that person think they shall receive anything from the Lord, because a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. A disciplined man says, I don't know what tomorrow brings, but I know who holds my tomorrow. The same one who came down through 42 generations. The same one who walked the dusty streets uh, of Jerusalem. The same one that they crowned uh, with a crown of thorns. The same one that they hung between uh, two thieves. Uh, that same one that they put in Joseph's tomb. That same one who got up on Sunday with all power in his hands. God has not given us the spirit of fear. I can get through this. If the Lord be with me, I can get through this. They may call me everything but a child of God, but I'm gonna get through this. Is there anybody in the house? Got a made up mind. It's hard, but I'm gonna get through it. It's rough, but I'm gonna get through it. Because he's enabled me, he's empowered me, and he upholds me so I can get through it. But you gotta discipline your mind because the battleground is in the mind. The enemy can repossess you if you're saved, but he attacks the mind. And that's why it's been said so eloquently and so truly, everything that comes to your mind ought to not come out of your mouth. Because death and life are in the power of the tongue. And what you consistently say, you will eventually get. I almost preached this morning about the process of sowing and reaping. Because some of us have sowed some seeds that we're reaping years down the road. And we can't understand why. Everything that comes to your mind ought to not come out of your mouth. But Jesus in the 12th chapter of Matthew says everything that comes out of your mouth on a consistent basis is a result of what's in your heart. Which means if you're 95% negative, your heart. Let me say it like this, you're in need of heart surgery. It's a bad heart. But even when you're going through, you might complain occasionally. But if you're positive and determined on a more consistent basis, that's a revelation of your heart. I don't know about you, but I've decided I can do this, and I will get through this. It's hard sometimes. It crosses your mind more than once. Just quit. Give it up. Go somewhere else. Hide from everybody. But when God has appointed you, and when God has anointed you, you just can't quit. Because you understand your potential, you understand your purpose, and you understand whose power 
you live by. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Brings all things to our remembrance. We give you praise for the lives of those who are present, for those who are streaming live, and those who would join us by way of radio. Many people are broken this morning. But God, let them leave here today knowing they can get through this. They've thought about quitting. They've thought about giving up. Some have even come to the conclusion it's over. Let them leave today knowing it ain't over till you say it's over. There's no storm. There's no situation. There's no circumstance. There's no battle that's too big for you. So grant your people peace of mind. Grant them, God, an understanding heart of your word to know that amid all that we're forced to go through, the changes, the challenges, the various vicissitudes of life, you will never leave us, nor forsake us. In those moments when it seems like our prayers are not even being heard. You tell us in Daniel that you hear us the first time we pray. But there's a spiritual warfare going on in the heavens where the enemy is trying to stop the answer from getting to us. But help us to have the diligence of Daniel and to keep on believing. Keep on praying. Not to grow weary and well-doing, but to know in due season we will reap if we faint not. Let us not leave here weary, but let us leave here today worshiping and praising your holy name for who you are, for what you've done, and for what you're yet to do. God, thank you that you've given us the assurance that we can get through this. Receive our prayer and receive our praise in Jesus' name. Give God a hand clap of praise today. I don't know what you're going through, what you've gone through. But I want you to leave here today knowing, as a child of God, the victory is yours. You've got to cry. But every tear, God is aware of. Every tear, he's aware of it. Every pain that goes in your body, he knows about it. And I stop by to tell you as a living witness and a testimony, even in the midst of what you're going through, when it looks like you're standing and there's a brick wall in front of you, you can get through this. If he can bring down the walls of Jericho, he can bring down your walls. That wall was thick enough for two chariots to ride side by side. But at a shout... In obedience to the word of God, the Bible says the walls came tumbling down. You can get through this. It might not happen on the first day. But he said walk around the walls. It may not happen on the second day. But walk around the walls. It may not happen on the third, fourth, or fifth day. But walk around the walls. It may not even happen on Saturday. But walk around the walls. But when you get here on Sunday morning, shout. 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 And watch the walls. Come tumbling down. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. On the seventh day, shout. You ain't got to pull no sword. You don't have to fight no battle. Just shout. In the name of Jesus. Because there's power in his name. There's hope in his name. There's happiness in his name. There's Holy Ghost power in his name. Is there anybody in the house that knows his name? J-E-S-U-S There's power to heal There's power to deliver There's power to get you through it But you gotta call I ain't got no power But in the name of Jesus Demons tremble In the name of Jesus Let us stand 
Hallelujah. There's power in his name. We walk by faith, not by sight. You see the hurts, you see the pains, you see the problems, you see the trouble. That's your sight. But your faith sees God. Your faith sees Christ. And your faith sees the Holy Spirit and those ministering angels that God has dispatched over you to watch over you. It might be somebody here today who has never accepted Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Before we go into our communion, I want to extend an invitation to you today. Maybe you were here today and you were broken and you were distraught and in despair. And God is saying to you, there's hope today for you. You don't have to leave here the way you came. The word was for you. But maybe you just need to rededicate yourself. Maybe you need to say, God, I backed up, I backslid, whatever. We've all been there, but I'm coming back today. I need this revival in me. I need to be restored. I need to be rejuvenated. I may even need to be initially regenerated. But if that's you today, as the choir leads us in a song of invitation, maybe you're coming for the first time, maybe you're rededicating your life, maybe you're coming because you don't have a church home and you want to become a part of our church family. Or maybe you are coming because you need somebody to pray with you. The prayers of the righteous availeth much. Amen. Praise the Lord. It might be somebody else. It might be somebody else here today. Come on, this is for you today. It might be someone else here. Come on unto the Lord. God is speaking to your heart right now. God is saying you can make it. You can get through this. They've talked about you. They've laughed at you. They mocked you. But you can get through this. Amen. Might be somebody else. Don't have a church home. Whoever you are, man, woman, boy, girl, by the power of God, come forth. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Remember, God didn't give us the spirit of fear. That's the devil telling you not to go. But God has given you power. He has a purpose. He's given you potential. You got to come, though. Will you trust him? Will you trust him today? Will you follow the spirit? If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, step by faith. If you want to come and you're afraid, just raise your hand. Somebody will come and walk with you. But this is your time. This is your moment to get serious about your salvation. This is your moment to listen to God and to listen to his voice. This is your moment to demonstrate God's power in your life. That was the message this morning at 8 o'clock from Brother Pedro. Why don't you come? Whoever you are, wherever you are. If you don't have a church home, why don't you come today? He'll heal you today. I've been on this journey 37 years now. And I've had some rough times. But he's kept me. I thought about quitting on numerous times. But he kept me. Before I got saved, before I got saved, I gave up on everything. But it's by his power that I can endure the hardships. It's by his grace that I can get through the storms of life. And so if you need that today, come. Christ has made it available to every one of us. You just got to come. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest until your souls take my yoke upon me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And you will find rest until your souls. Our last call. Jesus, you may be seated. I'll tell it everywhere I go. It's not too late. He'll hear you today. Make the wounded whole. Just before we do our communion, I want you to know that the Bible helps us understand that you don't have to leave here bruised. Isaiah 53 says, well, he was bruised for our iniquities. You don't have to leave here hurt. He was bruised for us. He died for us. He rose for us. Quit worrying about how people are going to look at you. Some of us are going to leave here today like we came. Because we're afraid that if we get up and we've been in church all our lives, what are they going to say about us? The question is not what they're going to say about us. The question is what God is going to say about you. 
Another question is, what is Satan saying about you? I told you they ain't got no faith. I told you they're afraid to do what you say. I told you they're more concerned about their flesh than you. It's not about what we think and what others think. It's about what God has said. There should be some cards in the pews in front of you that you can fill out. If not, you can get it from the, one of the ministers or deacons or myself after service. But if you didn't come and wanted to come, fill out those cards. Somebody will contact you and assist you in the area in which you fill them out. But we want you to leave here with the assurance of your salvation, with the assurance of your security in Christ, knowing that you've been sealed unto the day of redemption and that no weapon formed against you will prosper. They will come against you, but they won't prosper. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for the privilege of being able to share this time of communion. We pray for those who have come, those who stepped out by faith. You know the trials and the testings that they've gone through. and You even know what they got to go back to. And so often, God, many of them are damaged not because of what happens to them on the outside. They're damaged because of church folk criticizing and gossiping and always babbling at the mouth not allowing people the the opportunity to change as if we've always had it together and it's evidence we don't because if we did we wouldn't be gossiping I pray for these that have come and I pray that the church will surround them and love them to life not to be so concerned about a dress code, but to be more concerned about devoting themselves to the gospel of Jesus Christ and allow our people to grow in your word, to come to know you. I pray, God, that you would bless the bread that symbolizes the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Bless the juice that symbolizes the blood that was shed for the remission of our sins. And God, if you will, bless us, your people, as we come together in obedience to your word. For your word has said, as often as we do this, we are to do it in remembrance of you. So speak into our lives. Unite us today. Sanctify this moment, this time. Consecrate it to your glory. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, honor, and the glory. Forgive us of our sins and receive our prayer. We ask it, God, in Jesus' name, the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All those who are, we've had several people have been baptized and we failed to do this at the 8 o'clock, but if you're here today, we want to ask that you will come forth to receive your certificate of baptism and church membership as we uh, welcome you into our new family. So right now, if you're here, I want to ask that you will come. Cable Hunt Jr. Cable Hunt Jr. Cabell, okay. Jordan Hunt. We have Jordan Hunt. Trenton Douglas. All right, here's one. Marley Douglas. Marley Douglas. All right. Caden Blackford. She was at the 8 o'clock. I don't know if she's here. I saw her at the 8 o'clock. Isaiah Goins, Donna Giles, Kendall Brown. I'm going to ask that you all would stay up here so the church can fellowship with you after we give. If all you all would come back up, just stay up here, sit on the front row somewhere. Kendall Brown. All right. If you all just stay up here. All those who receive certificates, come back up if you will. We want to welcome you into our family. We're so happy that you have come. Which one is that? Okay. That's, okay, we have one more black, but she's not here. Yeah, she's at, she was at 8 o'clock. <laughs> Let's give our new members a hand clap of praise. Thank God for them. Okay. We also have all the certificates. If you're here today, we didn't call your name. If you didn't get yours, come and see uh, Deacon Derek. If you just raise your hand, and uh, he has them. 
Once again, God, we thank you for this opportunity to share in this wonderful time of communion as we reminisce and reflect upon what Christ has done for us, and not only us, but for the entire world. And so we pray, God, as we, in obedience to your word, that we would literally, God, come together as one, one body, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Never lose his power. The blood of Jesus. For oh, the blood. Has anyone had an opportunity to be served? Bible said when they went up a room, Jesus, he said the bread represents his body that would be literally broken and destroyed for humanity. He broke it and blessed it, said eat y'all of it. He said the wine symbolizes his blood shed for the remission of our sins. Drink ye all of it. As they departed singing a hymn, before we depart, we have a quick announcement because we have a lot of things coming up this weekend. So as Brother Chip and Ashley comes forth to remind us of what's going on this weekend, and I think it might be a video as well just before we take up our offering. I also want you to know that on this Wednesday, we will not have our services because we have a busy weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. As we celebrate 15 years as pastor and people, we thank God for it. Let's give God a hand clap of praise for his goodness toward us. And so we will resume our regular uh, summer-wide and summer-long revival on the following Wednesday. 
And, uh, but we're going to be here from Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And so it's going to be a great weekend, and they're here to tell us about it right now. Amen. All right. Uh, good afternoon. I am uh, sorry, I'm Chip Thomas. This is my wife, Ashley Thomas. Um, we'd like to, uh, if you could sh first show them the uh, PowerPoint. Um, so we're, we're going to be having something Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, Friday, we're having a free concert. You will not need a ticket. Um, we're going to have both of these groups singing with us and fellowshipping with us. Child care will be free um, when you attend and when you look forward to, look forward to seeing everyone here. Uh, afterwards, you'll be able to buy those, uh, the CDs, in the multi-purpose room. On Saturday, we're having a uh, free uh, picnic. Uh, it's going to be open for the community. Uh, that same day, there's going to be another festival, so you're going to need to use the route. Um, you get to church during the Gaslight Festival. So we're going to be having performances. Uh, food will be available. We're going to be having games for all ages, including a cakewalk, which starts at 5 o'clock. The time for the picnic is going to be 1 to 6. The lamp lighter gives um, a different time, but the time is... Uh, one to six, and uh, also we won't be having pony rides, but we will be having a lot of activities for everyone. And then on Sunday, um, we're, our guest preacher is going to be Pastor Thomas Beavers will be here. Um, please come out and show our pastor some love. Um, also, these ads, um, the, the ad on the next slide is on Facebook, so if you could share it. Uh, with as many people as possible. We'd really like to have everyone come out all three days. And if you'd like to volunteer, we're still looking for volunteers, uh, please contact Sister Hazel or Sister Glaniva. Our theme this year is the Shepherd's Call and the People's Charge, and we're going to be wearing any shades of blue, silver, or white. Thank you. Amen, amen. Praise God. <laughs> Miss Glaniva. The streets will be open. Amen. Yes. Danielle, you had a quick announcement. If they can hear you, it's fine. 